Today we're looking at Ethernaut level 17, which is recovery. And in this level, a contract creator has built a simple token factory contract. Anyone can use it to create new tokens with ease, but after deploying the first token contract, the creator sent 0.001 Ether to obtain more tokens, and then they have since lost the contract address. This level can be completed if we can recover the 0.001 Ether from the lost contract address. So let's take a look at the code. You can see we have two contracts here, the recovery contract and the simple token contract. So this is the actual token contract that the creator built. And this is the factory contract, which has a function called generate token, which just deploys a new simple token contract. So anybody can call this function to deploy their own simple token contracts. And inside simple token, we have a receive function. So anybody can send the simple token contract some ETH and in exchange for the ETH, their balance goes up. So they get more tokens in exchange for the ether. And so the creator sent some ether over here and now they've lost the address of this contract and we need to figure out a way to withdraw their money back from the contract. One function we do have here is we have a destroy function that is public and anybody can call it, which does a self-destruct. And if you remember from before, we learned that self-destruct, as it destroys the contract, it will also send back any remaining ETH that was in the contract to the address given to it. So we have two things to do here. We first need to figure out the address of the simple token contract. And secondly, we have to call destroy on there to retrieve the ether that is stuck in this contract. So we start off by getting a new instance for this and then we'll head on over to Remix. Once we have our instance, let's head on over to Remix and look at how we can figure out the address of the simple token contract. So I'm just gonna create a new file called recover.soul. And let me zoom in a little bit. Our instance address, this thing, this points to the recovery smart contract, which is the factory contract. And this factory will use to deploy a simple token contract. And we don't know the address to this. So how do addresses work? Well, we have two ways of solving this level. One is easy, one is more technical. Addresses are deterministic on Ethereum. So there is a specific way that the address of a contract is calculated. More specifically, what happens is the address of a contract, if it's being deployed through like a factory contract, the address of the contract is the, say so it's the last 20 bytes of the KekKak hash of the RLP encoding of the address that created it, so the sender address, and the nonce of that sender address. What does that mean? Let's, let's break this down. So sender address in this case is the address of the recovery smart contract, because that's the one that deployed simple token. Nonce is how many transactions has the sender address done. So since it was said that the simple token contract was the first one, they deployed the first token contract and then they lost the address. Since it was the first token contract they deployed, the nonce for the transaction is one. Now, RLP, I've opened this link over here. RLP stands for recursive length prefix serialization. So on Ethereum, you can send back and forth arbitrary data. You can send variable length arrays, uh, you know, dictionaries, structs, so on and so forth. So RLP is how the Ethereum network sort of encodes that data to figure out what is what actually. And the goal is again to identify like in an arbitrarily long data string to identify exactly which part of that data string is what, like what is an address, what is a number, right? What is a string and what is a struct and so on and so forth. So this is outlined in great detail on the ethereum.org website and in the Ethereum yellow paper on how RLP encoding works. But in this case, since we're talking about an address, the RLP of sender address and nonce is equal to the following values. It's equal to 0x d6, comma 0x94, comma the sender address, 
and then in our case since nonce is one then zero x zero one so let me break this down so nonce since nonce in our case is one for any number that is less than or equal to 127 the rlp encoding for it is the number itself there's no changes being made so since the nonce is one the rlp encoded value for the nonce is also just one and we're just representing it in hexadecimal instead for the address now however addresses are 20 bytes long and they're definitely bigger than 127 if looked at it from as a number for something like that what happens is to identify it as an address we add this rlp encoding in the beginning so 0xd6 0x94 is the encoding that identifies that this is an address and then after this the actual address uh, so this is kind of like the technical way and once we sort of understand this you know after we have the rlp encoded values then we just kek kek hash it and get the last 20 bytes out of it so in in solidity code what this would look like this whole thing this is equivalent to doing bytes one zero x d6 comma bytes one zero x nine four comma address of the recovery smart contract and comma bytes one zero x zero one once we have all of these values we pack them together we do an abi dot encode packed on it once we have the abi dot encode packed value which gives us a single byte string uh, we take the kkak hash so we do kkak 256 around this whole thing and with the kkak 256 again we get out a bytes 32 value which can be represented as a uint 256 so we take this bytes 32 value we convert it into a uint 256 and since we only care about the last 20 bytes of the hash uh, the way we can fetch that is by downcasting a uint 256 into a uint 160 right uint 256 is 32 bytes of data and uint 160 is 20 bytes of data so when we do a downcast from 32 bytes to 20 bytes it will throw away the first 12 bytes of the data and it will only keep the last 20 bytes and once we have the last 20 bytes represented as a number, finally, we just need to convert it into an address. So this long line of solidity code is basically the equivalent of this thing over here. And this whole thing together will give us the address of the simple token smart contract. This is the hard way. There is a much easier way to do this now. And the easier way is simply look up the recovery address on etherscan you can look it up on etherscan you can look at the transactions that were made and you can look at the transaction where the simple token contract was deployed and get the simple token contract address from there right so we'll we'll take both approaches so for the first approach we're going to code up a really simple contract uh, let's just say contract helper and all it has in it is it's a function that does get address and this takes in an address for the recovery contract and we'll say this is a public pure and returns an address and this will simply return this whole thing so it will return this whole thing and we'll just take this recovery address and put it in here right we don't need to cast it to an address it's already an address and we just put it in here. So I'm going to compile this code and we're going to deploy it on over to the Sepolia network. And while this is deploying, I'm going to also show you the other etherscan approach. So we have our instance address of the recovery contract and I'm currently on the Sepolia test network. So what I can do is I can go to Sepolia etherscan, search up this recovery contract address look at internal transactions and we see there are two contract creation transactions over here so the first one is when this contract itself the recovery contract itself was deployed and the second one is when the recovery contract was used to deploy a new simple token contract so if you look at the second transaction over here 
you can see it was used to deploy this contract. So I'm going to copy this address and I'm going to save it over here to show you that they both, both methods give us the same address back. Uh, with our helper, now that the helper is deployed, again, I'm going to copy our recovery contracts instance address, pass it to the get address function. It will give us this value and you can see it's the exact same address, right? So both approaches work. It doesn't matter. But the goal is, okay, now we have our address for the simple token contract that the creator lost. Maybe when he did it, he didn't have Etherscan and he didn't know about this method. Now that we have the address of the simple token contract, it is as simple as just calling the destroy function on it. Yeah, so what we can do now is I'm going to copy over this simple token contract into Remix and I will compile this. And with this being compiled, what I'm going to do, I'm going to choose simple token from here and load this as an existing contract at the address we've calculated. And once we've loaded it up, I'm just going to call destroy and I'm going to call destroy to my own address. So we'll do clear. I'll take my own address and I'll call it destroy with my own address. So it should self-destruct and send all the ether to my address. Once we've done that, let's take a look if simple token has any more balance now. So we can just do await get balance at the simple token contract address. It is now zero. Previously, uh, it was greater than zero. And now we should be good to just go ahead and submit instance, confirm. And there we go. We have completed this level. So what we learned from this is basically the fact that contract addresses are deterministic and they can be calculated. So because of this, it is possible to send ether to an address and that address might not have anything over there at that point in time, but later perhaps a contract can be created at that address which could withdraw that ETH. So it's kind of a non-intuitive way and also a bit dangerous way to store ether at an address without having the private key of that address as long as you have some sort of factory that you can use to, in the future, deploy a contract to that address. And also, since contract addresses are deterministic, you need to be very careful if you're creating sensitive business logic that revolves around the contract address being a specific thing or following a specific pattern. It needs to be validated and ensured very carefully. So that's about it. And I shall see you on the next one, which is going to be magic number.